Start up here. I don't know that uh, it had been read, but uh, thank you all for all the calls, the text, uh, the food, the visits, and most of all your prayers. Uh, we're so blessed to have a church family that cares so much for us. We love you all, the Bells, and we love you very much. <coughs> We're continuing to look at hope, and this morning we're going to look at the title of the message is The Sinner's Hope, not center, but sinner, The Sinner's Hope. And uh, have you ever hoped in something and it didn't come true and it wasn't there? Put, a fo put your hope in the wrong places. Well, a fellow, he joined the army, and he decided to go into the paratroopers. And so he went to paratrooper school and they learned how to uh, fold all the parachutes and do all of the work. And finally the day came that he was going to, to make his first jump. And uh, the, the sergeant had very carefully explained to him, he said, now look, you've got a parachute on the front, you pull your ripcord and it's going to open and you're going to float on down and there'll be a truck down there to pick you up. Now, if something happens, though, and that parachute doesn't open up, then you've got another little cord back here for another parachute that you're wearing. So pull that cord, and it'll open up, and you'll be rescued down below. So he went up, and they got up in the air, and all the fellows were jumping out, and he was watching all of those beautiful white clouds of... of uh, parachutes going on down and uh, he jumped out and they told him to count to 10 before he pulled the cord and so he counted to his 10 and he says 10 and he pulls the cord and nothing happened. Uh oh. He tried again and it didn't work. So then he, he reached back and he pulled that other cord and it didn't work. And he's floating on down. And as he gets down closer to the ground, he says, you know, nothing in this army works. And they don't keep their promises about anything. He says, I doubt that there's even a truck down there waiting for me. <laughs> Let me tell you about some hope, though, that's real. The sinner's hope. You know, the Bible, the Bible is always very, very clear about distinguishing good and bad, right and wrong, righteousness and sin. There are really no gray areas. There are no situational ethics. There are no excuses. We've all sinned. And we cannot justify ourselves. However, even though we cannot justify ourselves, there's still hope for us. All is not lost. We can be forgiven for those sins. And we can even receive the promised eternal life. It's real. And we don't have to depend on the army to wait down there for us. God has given it to us. We who are in Christ Jesus have been saved, we're being saved, and we shall be saved. So let's read Titus. Just going to read chapter 3, uh, verses 3 through 8. At one time, we too were foolish, disobedient, deceived, and enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. We lived in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another. But when the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared, he saved us, not because of righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth, and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ our Savior, 
so that, having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs, having the hope of eternal life. This is a trustworthy saying, and I want you to stress these things so that those who have trusted in God may be careful to devote themselves to doing what is good. These things are excellent and profitable for everyone. The good news. We've been saved. Or if you haven't been, you have the opportunity through faith in Jesus Christ. God sent his son to die for us, for our sins. And to open up the gates, the gates of heaven. We're saved. But we're saved from what? Good question. What are we saved from? Well, he says here that we are saved from our own foolishness. Now, I don't remember the last time I was called a fool, but I didn't like it. I can remember that. Nobody wants to be thought of as a fool. But he says that our own foolishness caused us to act and to do what we did in the past. And hopefully that's where it is. We look at scripture, we, we find someone who was a fool and, and we're not, you know, when we say that scripture is pretty clear, but sometimes it doesn't tell us everything. And it doesn't tell us everything about a man named Simon Magus. Now Simon Magus is also Simon the Magician, found in the book of Acts chapter 8. Simon was one of the Sumerians who believed in Jesus Christ when, when uh, Philip preached him. He believed and he was baptized into Christ. But, but, he saw what the Holy Spirit could do and he wanted to buy the power of the Spirit. He thought that he could buy it. He thought it was up for sale. The power of God. The power to perform miracles. Real miracles. The power. And so, he indeed, he tried to buy the Holy Spirit from Peter and John when they came. And I think that sometimes we have to understand the gospel's not for sale. Those miracles were never for, for sale. Christianity is, is not about profit. That's P-R-O-F-I-T. Even though it may be about prophets, P-R-O-P-H-E-T-S. But it is not about profit. We even find today that people preach a, a prosperity gospel. That if, if you're truly a Christian, then you're going to be healthy, wealthy, and wise. The scripture never says that. Not in the sense that we do in this world, the way we think, healthy, wealthy, and wise in this world. Oh, we're going to be healthy, wealthy, and wise in the things of God. Our life is going to be abundant, uh, so abundant that it's unbelievable, but not in the ways of the world. Now, the thing is, here we have this man trying to buy the Holy Spirit. He wanted to use the power. And Peter looked at him, and he says that I perceive that you are full of bitterness and you are captive to sin. And we question when we read here. 
You know, here's someone who says he believed. Here's someone who is even baptized into Christ. But as Augustine said, he was just a wet magician. A wet magician. We're saved from foolishness if we trust in the Lord. Now, it's kind of strange that he went to Peter because, you see, Peter, Peter had been saved from his foolishness and we know that he was saved from his foolishness. Just like we can be saved from our foolishness. Peter, Peter was so confident in himself when Jesus said, you're going to betray me. Before the cock crows, you're going, to be, you're going to betray me three times. And Peter says, oh, no, no, not me. And, and, and Peter sought to prove that <clears throat> when they came to arrest him. Peter was one of those who had one of the two swords that was there. And he took his sword out and he cut off the ear of Malchus, the high priest's servant. He was ready to die for Jesus right then. But Jesus said, that's not the way we do it. He put the ear back on and he healed Malchus. And Peter drifted on following him where they were taking Jesus to the high priest's court or his house. And he sat there in the courtyard and he said, as he was there in his courtyard, here is this man who's ready to die for Jesus, who's going to make a very foolish, do a very foolish thing. Three times. They came by. Hey, you were with him, weren't you? You're one of them. You're, you're from Galilee. And every time it's, no, 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 no. And he even swore down curses on them for even saying so. A foolish man. But Jesus restored him later. Later on after the resurrection, Jesus was uh, down by the, the seashore and Peter and his, uh, some of his uh, apostle friends had gone fishing. They had caught had a nice catch and they came in and there was Jesus on the shore already cooking fish. And Jesus looked at Simon and he said, Simon, do you love me? And Simon said, you know I love you. And he said, Simon, do you love me? Lord, you know I love you. Simon, do you love me? Lord, you know I love you. And he found, he found forgiveness even in the midst of his foolishness. We also, we're forgiven from what else? We're forgiven for our own disobedience. Oh, no, we're not disobedient. We've never been disobedient. Oh, yes, we have, every one of us. Every one of us. And it goes all the way back to Adam and Eve. They were disobedient, and so are we. And it's not being disobedient accidentally. We're not talking about being disobedient unthinkingly. But we're talking about deliberate, deliberate sin. Deliberate. And you realize that, especially the unsaved, they don't even want to admit that. They make excuses. They say, no. But I had a reason for doing it. Circumstances made him do it. But listen, we have been disobedient. And we're saved from that. We've been deceived. We've been enticed. We've been enslaved by our own passions and, passions and pleasures. And we can still find forgiveness. There's hope for sinners. There's hope for us. Because Jesus holds out forgiveness. 
Not just one time, but all the time. He saved us and He continues saving us. And He will save us on the day He returns. Salvation. Listen, if you think that perhaps maybe uh, we're carrying this a little too far about your sin. Listen, we carry around with us malice. Have you ever wanted revenge? Have you ever wanted to get even? And if you try to tell me no, then we need to do a little counseling. Because indeed, we find that yes, we have all wanted a little revenge. Especially if you get out on the highway and drive and that guy cuts you off and you want some revenge. You want at least somebody to come along and give him a ticket. Yeah. And we're saved from that. And we're saved from that envy he speaks of here. Envy. Jealousy. Oh, I'm not jealous. <laughs> yeah, I know none of us are in our own eyes. But you know what? Even those Jews, the high priests, the people who were in power in Jerusalem, the people of the Sanhedrin, the teachers of the law, they all plotted against Jesus. And even Pilate could see their jealousy and envy. And he knew that that's why they wanted him dead. Because they were envious of Jesus' power because he was healing people. And they were envious of his popularity because people followed him and listened to him. He says, we've been forgiven for our envy. And then we get to this other word here. Now, in, in your, your household or in your family, you may not allow this word. Uh, you may water it down. <clears throat> and the water is hate. The word is hate. Hate. We often don't let our children say, you can't say I hate somebody. We don't want to hear it. Scripture says, we, we went around hated. People hated us. And we hated people. Now we try to water it down by saying, well, it's not that I hate somebody, but I just don't like them. What's the difference? There isn't any. Hatred. We can be forgiven for it. We hate people based on, on socioeconomic reasons. Uh, they've got more than we've got or they're not good enough for us. Uh, because they've got gifts. Oh, you can play the piano. I want to play the piano. Oh, you got a beautiful voice. You can sing real good. I want to sing real good. Jealousy and hatred for those kinds of reasons. You know, the Bible teaches us differently, though. No more hatred. Ten times in the New Testament, it says, there's another way. Love one another. Love one another. And isn't it great when you see a congregation that tries to practice that completely? Love one another. <coughs> 21 times, or excuse me, 12 times, it says, love your neighbor. And three times, guess what? 
it says you're supposed to hate. I mean, you're supposed to love. I, get, I better get it right, anyway. not You're supposed to love all of those all of those bombers and all of those Muslims that are killing us and all of those anyone that's doing damage to us. We're supposed to love them. Love your enemies. Desire good for them and not revenge and not evil. That never means that justice is not supposed to be done because God is a God of justice as well. But as far as it is concerned with us, we don't need to stack up enemies and pile them up so that we've got a lot. We need to love our enemies. We're saved. We're saved from our own foolishness. We're saved from our own disobedient nature. We're saved from all of those nasty words and thoughts. We're saved. Now we're saved by what? We're saved from what? We're saved from our sin. There is hope for us. I can find forgiveness in Christ. And of course, he expects us to forgive as well. But we're saved. And we're saved by what? It says here we are saved by the kindness and the love of God. The kindness and the love of God. <coughs> I don't use the King James Version, but there's a nice word in the King James Version that I love. And it's, it's found 21 times in the book of Psalms, only four times in Jeremiah, only once in Hosea, and none anywhere else. But the word is hesed, and it means loving kindness. And it's neat the way that Titus, that we find here in Titus, that Paul has put it together when he says, the kindness and the love of God. It is the loving kindness of God that gives us mercy and saves us. Psalm 51, 1, have mercy on me, O God. According to what? According to your loving kindness. According to the multitude of your tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Your loving kindness, God's loving kindness, that's the way he treats our sin. He treats it with loving kindness for the sinner. He doesn't excuse the sin, but he treats the sinner with loving kindness. And the psalmist in Psalm 63, 3, David, he really understood something about God. He said, because of your loving kindness, or because, you, because your loving kindness is better than life. It's better than than life. That's how good God's loving kindness is. His mercy and His grace. When we stand before God's court, we stand guilty, deserving eternal death. Make no mistake, we are guilty. We're as guilty as Dylan Roof. But God's loving kindness in the person of Jesus Christ takes away our guilt. Because he paid the price for us so that we are justified. We are made righteous by the blood. God's loving kindness, his mercy, his grace is much more than, than just the forgiveness of sin. It's more than just our guilt being taken away. He washes us. He cleans us up so thoroughly that it's described as starting all over again. 
a rebirth. A rebirth. And it's more than any do-over. And it's more than any second chance. It's a brand new life. And it is life by the Spirit. It is not life by law. It is a Spirit-led life. That's what we're saved to. God saves us from all the garbage of our lives. And this is what He does for us. We have been forgiven. We have been washed. We have been justified. We have been sanctified. And we have been set apart for heaven above. That's what's for us. All of this mercy and grace and loving kindness has been poured out upon us generously. I like the word lavished because he's lavished it on us. Wow. Overflowing. And all of this comes by not only believing in God, because that's not quite enough, but also by trusting in Him. And when you trust Him, you obey Him. You obey Him. Grace comes by, by faith. But listen, it doesn't come without repentance. It doesn't come without commitment. It doesn't come without change. It doesn't come apart from obedience. You got to have those sins washed away. Jesus himself said, If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Let me tell you, there is no cheap grace, there is no selfish faith. There is no greed in salvation. Know this also. Living for Jesus is living the abundant life. Not the world's concept of the abundant life, which is just simply another form of greed, but an abundant life of loving and giving. We are saved by God's overflowing grace. And the next question we have to ask is, we're saved for what? Well, one is, we're going to live forever. We're saved to live forever. The dreams and the songs even of lost mankind is, I want to live forever. However, it's not a dream for us. For we who are in Christ, it's a reality. And it's more than just eternal life with God. And with Jesus and the myriad of God's people and the host of God's angels. It's not a continuation of life. It's bliss. It's without maladies. The maladies of this fallen world. There's no sin. There's no diseases. There's no fears or anxieties. There is the true peace of God. The reality of the blessing of shalom. Peace. No enemies, no drama, no hurt feelings, nothing negative at all. It's a land of endless joy and praise. We're saved for eternity. And we're saved for joy and praise in the present. We're saved so that we may devote ourselves to doing good. That's what he says. To do good works. Oh, not that we gain anything. It's not for a reward. It's not, we don't do the works to be saved. It's doing them. Why? Because it's the good thing to do. It's the right thing to do. It's the excellent thing to do. To do good works. Because it is really profitable for everyone. We're to imitate the mercy, the grace, and the loving kindness of our Father in heaven. We're to slander no one. We're to be peaceable. We're to be considerate and to show true humility toward all men. 
the humility that Christ showed.